when I came to Hollywood in 1973 to sell Chinese movies, I had to go calling on these really wise gods. And I'll never forget sitting at, in a studio with this head of distribution for America, and he looks at me and he says, son, I've looked at these kung fu -y things. He said, you gotta understand one thing. That'll never work in America. When Americans fight, they use their fists. It's un-American to kick somebody. Uh, okay. And I went to another studio, another tough, hard-bitten head of distribution. He said, son, you don't understand. The world doesn't want to see anybody but John Wayne winning. John Wayne is the good guy. You can't have Chinese winning things. Who's going to go and see that? When I joined Golden Harvest, I remember being shown The Big Boss, and then they ran The Fist of Fury for me. And seeing these movies, which were, to be very honest, quite primitive, and a bit of a shock to me, because I was coming from seeing Hollywood movies, where the production standards and the sets were a little bit better, and the acting, shall we say, was a little bit more natural and not quite as stylized. And I never forget, there's a wonderful scene in Big Boss where Bruce Lee punches a guy, and the guy goes through the wooden wall. You could see where the jigsaw had cut out the, <laughs> the silhouette of the guy. But yeah, sort of, it was charming. It was the early 70s, and what the hell. The next day, I had to meet Raymond Chow for the first time. But he said, do you think you can sell these movies to the West? That was his first question to me. How would I know if we could sell movies to the West? I was 20 years old. I just graduated from university. But he was very interested in, in an average person's point of view. In 1972, the company was actually less than two years old. And he was financially very strapped. And we were locked in a death struggle with Shaw Brothers, the predominant Chinese studio in Asia at the time. Raymond Chow and Leonard Ho had actually left Shaw Brothers to set up Golden Harvest. And so we were very constricted in the kinds of movies we could make and the places we could make them because Shaw Brothers was making the hidden threat of, well, you want to work with Shaw Brothers, you better not go and work with Golden Harvest. Because we didn't have access to a lot of stars, we were much more open-minded to the idea of collaborating with people. Our primary model became with actors and directors to bring them in and sign them to a two or three picture contract. They would make three movies over 18 months. Bruce Lee was signed by Golden Harvest, in truth, because Bruce rejected the Shaw Brothers' seven-year contract. What we were really looking at over the period of that 18 months in those first three deals was how easy were they to work with and how marketable were they. Actors can have a big impact on what a movie costs, not just by their salary, but how they behave on the set whether they show up and they're on time and they know their lines, or they're willing to try the stunt, or they're willing to go off and learn what other skill sets they need. The same with a director that says, no, no, I have to shoot this when the clouds are only perfect, versus a director that says, don't worry about the clouds, I know how to get the scene, and the scene isn't about the clouds. And by then, if they were in the family of Golden Harvest, usually they would end up with their own production company. And the Golden Harvest system was, we'll give you this much money to finance the company, you'll be responsible for the people you hire, and you'll be responsible for your own operations, and we'll review it every couple of years and see how you're doing. And for those that were successful, that relationship could last a long time. <laughs> There was a time when Jackie Chan was a young stuntman at Golden Harvest, and he wasn't one of the chosen ones. Sammo Hung was one of the chosen ones, because Golden Harvest had decided to groom Sammo as an action coordinator, and his aspiration was to be a director and a star. That's how he ended up in Enter the Dragon. And I sat down with Jackie, and he was saying to me very earnestly, I don't want to be Bruce Lee. 
I'm saying, we'll try you in a little part in Cannonball Run. It'll give us a chance to test the audience. That's a very different way of testing you from dubbing Drunken Master into English. We'll see how you play in English with an American audience. Then we'll decide what your career is going to be. You're trying to help them find what gives them the uniqueness and the quality of voice that gives them the confidence to go forward to do their best work. Jackie Chan makes comedy. We can't try and make him into Bruce Lee because he doesn't have a face that scares the shit out of you. He's Jackie. He's funny and he's charming and you want to protect him. <laughs> Raymond and Leonard were also smart enough that if he would come to them and say, gee, I want to go and do Shakespeare, they say, no, 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 you really shouldn't be doing Shakespeare, right? But we were doing serious market research and trying to understand why audience liked what we were doing so we could give them more of what they liked. What is that quality that people are going to relate to, people are going to respond to? Because remember, a fan's relationship with an actor is a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And without fan base, you can't have stars. You may have great actors that win awards, but so what? They won the award doesn't mean anybody to come back and see them next year. A fan is somebody that forgives you for making a bad movie and will be there to see the next one. <laughs> Raymond and Leonard took criticism well. And they learned from the criticism. After you see a movie, let's skip the things you like. Let's just talk about the things that don't work. Directors and actors like to hear the praise. But as producers, as businessmen, it's important for us to understand what's not working. Because that's where we're blind. If you see there's a problem, you're going to try and fix the problem. We were certainly the first studio in Hong Kong to be hiring the students graduating, coming back from American film schools, which were just being set up, or uh, English and Australian film schools after they were set up. David Chan, right, he was responsible for all of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies. Peter Chan Ho Sun, the director, actually started out as a continuity boy, working with John Woo and then ultimately with Jackie Chan. Another notable example, Terence Chang. Terence was, for many, many years, not only John Woo's producer, he was John Woo's confidant and manager. Those people became quite instrumental in helping Hollywood to learn about the Asian film industry and ultimately have been quite impactful in helping the mm, mainland China film industry to uh, understand a lot of the do's and don'ts in Hollywood. How did Golden Harvest manage to succeed in the 1970s, facing a much bigger and more entrenched adversary in Shaw Brothers? In one line, it was very simple. Shaw Brothers was following the old trend. They were still making sword movies, you know, with people flying through the air and sort of fantasy sword fights, and old-fashioned romantic dramas. And that was clearly not what young audiences wanted to see in Asia. Let's face it, you have to remember, making film entertainment is still commerce. It was about who's hot, what trends are hot. It was the generation of the late 60s, early 70s. This was a generation that was tired of seeing old-fashioned movies that always had a moralistic ending to them. They were looking for movies where there were young actors that spoke the same vernacular language that they spoke that had the same morality as their parents or the same morality that they had been raised with, but might be a little bit quicker to action. What martial arts movies did was allowed people to entertain the idea that they too could be a hero. You didn't have to be the fastest gunslinger with the most expensive gun or the fastest swordsman after 10 years of studying, you were seeing movies in which people used their bare hands, their fists, their feet, to defend themselves and to overcome opponents. We went to Europe with movies and we tested old-fashioned sword movies versus uh, martial arts movies, the most famous being Bruce Lee. 
and seeing that they like the martial arts movies and they like the underdog doing the righteous thing, standing up for the oppressed. It's a pretty universal theme. So we made more of those kind of movies. And the same when we brought the movies to America. And ultimately, as we took them to South America and to Africa. The other thing that came out of that early 1970s, you had Hollywood standing supreme and being the main purveyor of international movies. But those were movies that were primarily white faces. The fantastic thing that we learned and we were able to capitalize on was not just martial arts. We were striking a very resonant chord with minorities everywhere. When the movies opened in the States, we had huge, huge audiences in the inner cities. Black audiences fell in love with martial arts movies. Why? Here was a Chinese guy beating the hell out of white guys for a change. That you can point directly to the beginning of the exploitation of martial arts movies from Asia on a global basis. There was nobody getting rich at Golden Harvest. Every dollar was going on the screen. The first Bruce Lee movie was produced for under 150,000 US dollars. The second Bruce Lee movie was considered to be an expensive movie by Hong Kong standards, a little bit under 300,000 US dollars. Return of the Dragon, the movie shot in Italy, ultimately was more expensive, but not that much more expensive, 350,000, 400,000, which meant that they were making back five times their investment, six times their investment, maybe even the princely sum of 10 times their investment. When we did Enter the Dragon, which was 1973, all in, we spent less than a half a million US. The first check that Golden Harvest received from Warner Brothers was 12 million US dollars. <laughs> that would pay for the entire Golden Harvest slate for two years. But equally important to Golden Harvest in those days financially, right behind the Bruce Lee movies, we took the Hoy brothers, Samuel Hoy, Michael Hoy, were very popular celebrities in Hong Kong. We did a number of experiments and ultimately we launched the Hoy Brothers movies in Japan and in the mid late 70s through to the mid 80s, the Hoy Brothers movies were generating more money out of Japan per picture than we generated out of the rest of Asia combined. No Chinese company has ever succeeded in launching Chinese comedies in Japan, except for Golden Harvest. Marketing Bruce Lee was not a slam dunk either in the beginning. Well, the Japanese are not really interested in buying a movie that is about a Chinese guy beating the hell out of a bunch of Japanese. It's just no market. <laughs> Convincing them to try it and then showing them a way to market it was part friendly persuasion, but part of it was open-mindedness of having an honest exchange between companies that wanted to work together. Because if you had an actor that played well in overseas Chinese markets and he would play well in the Japan market, well, once you had that key, Hollywood would start to pay attention to you. When Dixon Poon signed a young actress named Michelle Yeoh, to make Michelle into an international star, the first thing we need to do is we need to conquer the Japan market. The same with Jet Li. And he came down to Hong Kong and people were very excited because he was an amazing martial artist. I, I remember Raymond calling me in the States and saying, I'm really excited. Have you seen this guy? You've got to see him. He only had one question he really wanted to ask me after I'd seen the movie. And so, what do you think? I said, Raymond? Yes. The answer is yes, providing you put him through the normal drill. That was the way Golden Harvest always operated. That's why John Woo was there for so many years. Terrence Chang was there. Peter Chan was there. Andrew Lau doing all of his movies. They all started out doing movies at Golden Harvest until they got tired of the handcuffs around them not to spend too much money. And the truth was, the only way the handcuffs were taken off was once the studio had confidence that you really knew what you were doing, that whatever you spent, you expected to make it back fivefold or sixfold. And then Jackie could do whatever he wanted or I could do whatever I wanted and ultimately John Woo could do whatever he wanted. And the company really went along then from strength to strength to strength from 1980, 81, Ryan Idol, truly up until the mid 1990s. To whatever extent, Golden Harvest and those funny little movies we were making 
had an impact on generations of filmmakers, great. I like to think there but by the grace of God we went not knowing what we could or couldn't do and we certainly didn't know how it was going to touch people's lives. The first time it really happened to me I was at the Matrix One and I'm sitting there with a young director from Hong Kong, Stanley Tong, who had done the police story with Michelle and Jackie and a lot of other good stuff. And he had just come to America and so we're sitting there and we're about 20 minutes into the movie and he leans over and he says, do you realize that's the fight from Game of Death? To now see martial arts included in just about any action movie, it's not about John Wayne throwing a punch, it's part of the vernacular of the world. That's kind of cool. That all comes out of what I consider to be the Golden Harvest legacy.